session will be moderated by Mr. Jacob Hulgren from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Mr. Hulgren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and most welcome to this uh, first afternoon parallel session focusing on the state of alliances. I'd like to start off by, by thanking warmly uh, Honorary Chairman M.J. Jung, as, as well as Chairman Yun Yong Kwan, and of course, President Che Kwang for, for the invitation to this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, panel this afternoon. So the overarching question that we're going to look at in this auspicious year where we're celebrating 70 years of the U.S. Rock Alliance and at the eve of the Yoon Biden uh, summit is what is the state of alliances. And this has been covered in various ways already uh, this morning, and we're going to drill a little deeper into that. Because I think, I think it's obvious that uh, the U.S. corporation and with its allies uh, has strengthened quite a lot uh, recently as a result of the U.S.-China rivalry, which has been talked about this morning, how it's getting fiercer and worse, where Taiwan is an obvious choke point. But of course, also uh, because of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine uh, which in many ways has galvanized <coughs> uh, uh, the alliances, uh, certainly so in, in, in Europe. And I am uh, from Sweden. I'm director of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. As was mentioned this morning, Finland and Sweden took the uh, quite remarkable step to, to join uh, NATO. Uh, Finland has already, and Sweden is at the doorstep. And I think that is, if, if not... Uh, a quite a spectacular illustration of the enduring attraction of an alliance like, like NATO. Still, as we will discuss, uh, some questions uh, remain. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and this has already come up to some extent, that there is uh, concerns or maybe even distrust of, of the U.S. Uh, and, uh, in, in some places. Uh, uh, the disorganized withdrawal from Afghanistan was mentioned. Uh, unilateral tendencies from the U.S., such as the effects of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, potential damage by recent uh, intelligence leaks, and maybe also concerns looming on the horizon over future U.S. future U.S. administration's commitment to to uh, these uh, alliances. Uh, meanwhile, I think there is a lot of alliance activities uh, which shows that it's, it's really alive and very uh, vibrant. Uh, the U.S. and ROC recently conducted an, uh, the uh, biggest military joint drills in, I think, five or four, six uh, years. Uh, we have a new and, and active trilateral collaboration between the U.S., Japan, and the Republic of Korea. And I think it's also quite interesting to see the closer relations between the Asia-Pacific U.S. alliances and, and the European one, NATO, which is taking place with uh, uh, heads of states and government from the Republic of Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, etc., visiting NATO summits. And, and next time it's going to be in, in Vilnius in, in, in July. Uh, there is a new alliance in AUKUS which has been formed. Uh, a little bit, uh, we've talked a little bit about the U.S.-Philippine alliance, which take, seems to take on a new, new uh, and, and stronger uh, intensity here with the, with the new U.S. basis. And then uh, uh, there is lots of other activities in addition to or beyond alliances or min minilaterals, as, as someone. Uh, called it. AUKUS was <coughs> mentioned. Uh, uh, we've talked about the, the Quad, which is an interesting uh, uh, new uh, uh, type of partnership which is taking shape and becoming uh, more and more intensive. Uh, and then we have the wider Indo-Pacific Corporation, which is also being strained, uh, strengthened. And uh, coming from Sweden, which is holding the, the current uh, rotating EU presidency, uh, uh, Swedish government is, is hosting a, an, a European uh, Indo-Pacific ministerial forum in just a couple of weeks with most of these countries present. That's beyond alliances, but I think it's, it's important to see the big uh, picture. So with all of this in mind, 
how are the alliances changing uh, and developing with the new geopolitical circumstances in, in uh, mind? Uh, stronger and more assertive China, uh, Russia that is openly waging war uh, against our alliances, I think it's said explicitly in Russia's uh, case. So there's plenty of questions here. So what state are the alliances in? Uh, have we lost faith in the US or not? It uh, would be interesting to hear your views. Are the alliances the right ones? Uh, and what is the perception among uh, the allies of, of US leadership? Uh, uh, what dilemmas uh, are the US facing in this, uh, this landscape? And, and how can the, the, they somehow be uh, developed? So uh, with this long introduction, uh, I would like to, to turn to uh, the panel uh, because uh, to help us to illuminate and illustrate some of these issues, and you can pick and choose yourself, of course, uh, we have an eminent uh, panel uh, representing uh, Europe, uh, Japan, uh, Republic of Korea, and the United uh, States. You each have five minutes for your introductory remarks, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion and bring in the audience. And, and we will go on until 14.40. Uh, uh, That's the time, a little bit extended time that we've been allocated. So I'll go in this uh, order. So uh, General uh, Che byung yuk uh, uh, you're from the Council of Korea UN Security Studies. Uh, you used to be the Deputy Commander of uh, Combined Forces Command here in, in, in Korea. Uh, what, what do you have to say to these issues? Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Hasgren. Um, as uh, the Honorary Chairman Chong mentioned this morning, uh, to be the first speaker is not easy for me, <laughs> especially after having lunch. Uh, thank you anyway. And I want to say my sincere thanks to uh, Honorary Chairman Chong and uh, the ASAN Institute for organizing this uh, significant symposium. I'm very honored to be here uh, with the renowned international expert and this spec, uh, special session. The theme of this uh, special session is the, the state of alliances. In, in this room, as, as you see, uh, there are six experts uh, from five different countries, uh, from Sweden and Republic of Korea and British and also Europe and, and also Japan and, and um, other countries. Uh, so, I'm going to present my opinion uh, on the state of Iraq-U.S. alliance uh, from the standpoint of Republic of Korea. I think the state of Iraq and U.S. alliance is getting stronger and closer than ever. Uh, it is, we, we say, unbreakable and evolving uh, toward the future. The Iraq-U.S. alliance has been a <coughs> cornerstone of the Republic of Korea, uh, Korea's security, economy, and foreign policy since its formation from 1953. The alliance has been vital in maintaining peace and stability on the, on the peninsula. This alliance has been built on a strong foundation uh, of shared democratic values such as uh, democracies, and human rights, and rule, rule of law, and, and, and mutual interest, and a commitment to regional uh, security and stability. According to recent several surveys uh, conducted, by, conducted from last year to this March uh, by ASAN Institute and Donga Ilbo and Ministry of Patriot and Veterans Affairs, 61% uh, to 91% of South Koreans supported the ROC US alliance, and 88% of Korean public confided in US security guarantee affirmatively, and 82% supported the US forces in Korea. But in the last several years, ROC US alliance has been went through a lot of change challenges through internally and in, in internationally. 
Last year in May, right after the launch of Yoon Song Yeol government, the ROC and US are striving to develop a future-oriented alliance uh, in, the rapidly, in a rapidly changing security environment through summit. This history summit between two leaders was a significant step forward. Our government presented the direction of future ROC US alliance, so called Global Comprehensive Strategic Alliance, which includes not only defense lalum, but also in all areas of economy, advanced science and technology, space, cyber, pandemic, and climate change in response and cultural issues. President Biden also expressed his willingness to support uh, the alliance and be with the Republic of Korea in the future. And from yesterday, as you know, President Yoon and First Lady is making seven-day state visit to America. I firmly believe that this state visit and summit will strengthen the rugby alliance uh, into a global strategic alliance. But you know, we see a lot of challenges. There is much work to be done. Importantly, uh, last Wednesday, President Yoon was interviewed by Loiter <coughs> ahead of his visit uh, to the United States. <coughs> After the interview, it was re reported that, and then immediately, uh, Russia, China, and North Korea issued very lewd warning and threat to the Republic of Korea. In response to President Yoon's comment to questions, about military support for Ukraine and the Taiwanese straight issues. I see this happening as a symbolic event. It shows the vulnerabilities of the geopolitics and the security instability of the Republic of Korea. And I believe it is an event that Russia, China, and North Korea have shown their intention to strengthen their authoritarian solidarity against liberal democracies. The current environment, security environment is not favorable to the Republic of Korea, in particular on the peninsula. The North Korea is stepping up her nuclear and missile development program and boldly intimidating rock US alliance. In order for the Rock US Alliance to develop global comprehensive strategic alliance, efforts should be made to enhance credibility and accountability of the alliance. I suggest that three things need to be implemented for this. Firstly, prefer concrete and transparent expanded deterrence measures and enhance Rock US combined readiness which should be developed against North Korean nuclear weapons and missile threat. As I mentioned ahead, the result of recent survey from 70% to 76% of respondents supported developing indigenous nuclear weapons program and 59% supported the redeployment of US tactical nuclear weapons on the peninsula and 38% opposed. This means South Koreans want more actionable and feasible options against North Korean nuclear weapons threat. So I recommend that rock US government needed to develop tangible extended deterrence options, such as redeployment of uh, tactical nuclear weapons or developing nuclear war up plan and just like a NATO-style nuclear planning group, or a TTX-like steadfast noon. Secondly, especially a new, support, new supply chain ecosystem between ROC and US to support alliance that cannot be separated militarily and economically. For example, the reciprocal defense procured program has already been signed by U.S. with the 28 allies and partner states, but 
not with the Republic of Korea. It is a reciprocal defense procure program, MOU, signed. Rock U.S. could be more strongly combined militarily and economically. This would be help to deepen military and economic ties and strengthen the overall bilateral relationship. Finally, develop Rock U.S. Japan trilateral security cooperation in a multi-layered manner. Trilateral security cooperation among three nations from the policy level to the tactical level. It will work very efficiently in case of emergency. According to the survey, 83% of the respondents supported the Rock U.S. Japan trilateral security cooperation. <coughs> I think that trilateral security cooperation is essential to increase the Rock U.S. alliance capability and to stabilize the security environment in the Northeast Asia and the, in the Pacific area against the, the China, Russia, North Korean threat. In conclusion, I think the current and future, the state of Rock U.S. alliance is strongly evolving. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks a lot, uh, General Chair, for, for those uh, remarks. Interesting to hear that the popular support for the Rock U.S. alliance is so, so strong in, in Korea. Uh, very interesting to hear your suggestions here. There's already been a lot of talk about uh, the needs for nuclear uh, deterrence here, but what you say at the end of developing U.S. Rock Japan uh, trilateral defense uh, uh, cooperation, I think is, is quite interesting. As, a, as another uh, aspect of how to increase alliances. So uh, let's move on to Andrew Harrison, your Lieutenant Colonel and uh, Deputy Commander of the United Nations Command. Uh, great position uh, here in Korea. You're a UK paratrooper by profession. You have fought in Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, Iraq, Afghanistan. I think it says that you've spent almost seven years deployed in, in, in combat. Uh, you know what we're talking about, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I start by saying that when I sort of signed up for the military in mid '80s, um, <coughs> I fought for really 10 years for, for the UK, predominantly in Northern Ireland. <coughs> but really, since 1994, all of those camp campaigns I fought in three times. For the three times to the United Nations, and many, many times under US leadership in various coalitions around the world in trouble spots I'm sure you'll be familiar with. I, I fought in coalitions. Mm. So from 1994, everything I have been involved in has been with a coalition. And, um, and I'm quite interested, but not surprised, that in the 10, 15 minutes we've had thus far, there has been no mention of the United Nations command. Now, my job, I'm the Deputy Commander of the United Nations Command. Um, I work under Paul the Camera, who's currently on the state visit in Washington, um, supporting President Yoon. And uh, everything we do is in support of the Republic of Korea. And very much the conversation is about the focus on the U.S. alliance um, and the Rock U.S. alliance. But you know, my understanding of international relations is an alliance is based on a treaty generally, and that's the, the normal definition of an alliance. But in the national defense strategy that the United States published last year, 117 times it mentioned allies and partners. <coughs> and this is a great strength that the United Nations Command brings to the Republic of Korea and the US, and on the fringes, of course, Japan and any trilateral arrangements that might uh, come about. But it seems to me it's a great secret. And as I've traveled um, around Europe and, uh, and the hotspots uh, of, of Ukraine in the last few months, I've understood two things. One, that a partnership, the, the, the partner, the, the partners that were set up under the United Nations Security Council resolutions in 1950 are critical to give two things that are absolutely vital 
for the US ROC alliance and for the Republic of Korea. The first of those is legitimacy. And quite often, in the campaigns I've been involved in, the first battle is about a tactical or a strategic war aim. But it always turns to keeping the alliance or the coalition together, whether it be Iraq, Afghanistan. It always starts with you know, weapons of mass destruction or Saddam Hussein or something that's tangible, but it always turns into keeping the legitimacy for the mission. Otherwise, that coalition, that alliance, that, that grouping will fracture. So that's, that's the first thing that the <coughs> UNC will bring to the Republic of Korea in any travails that are going to come in the future. And the second thing is strategic depth. And I think there can be no more poignant example of that than, it, than what's going on at the moment in the Ukraine. And I think this is a great lesson that's been identified by my friends uh, on the peninsula. And people have seen how important that strategic depth is. Because as fulsome as the arsenals from America and the Republic of Korea are, they will empty, and they'll empty quite quickly. And this isn't one problem in the world. And America and the ROC US alliance have to focus on a number of problems around the world. So why wouldn't you take advantage of the ready-made combined joint task force that is effectively the UNC and rely on that and build the relationship with that in <coughs> preparation for difficult days that might come in the future? And we may not be able to react instantly, but of course, President Zelensky didn't get a reaction instantly. And I think with the nature of warfare now, why on earth wouldn't you take advantage of the 16 nations that comprise of member states of the United Nations Command and the, take advantage of the history that we're fortunate enough to have in, in this part of the world? So, um, so that, I think, is my plea um, as we go forward, the relationship that the UNC has with the government and with, um, and with my rock friends is incredibly strong and has get, gets stronger every month. Uh, and I must say, on the, all the exercises we've done over the last few months, uh, that just gets stronger every week. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot for that, I think, very useful <coughs> reminder uh, about the United Nations Command. And it's true that if you define alliances in the strict <coughs> sense of the term, you lose out uh, a, a lot. Uh, and I think the key word here is uh, fight and work in coalitions, uh, right? Uh, and how that lends legitimacy, legitimacy and, and, and strategic depth. Very interesting. Uh, we're looking at that in Scandinavia these days as well, how Finland and Sweden's uh, accession to NATO brings new strategic depth. I, I, I understand uh, what you're talking about there. Very, very interesting. Let's, let's come back to some of those issues. And, but let me now turn to Honorable Representative Kim of the National Assembly. Uh, you're also sitting on the National Defense Committee. And before uh, entering politics, uh, you served in, uh, in Korean military for almost 40 years, a retired four-star general as well. Uh, uh, and you've also been uh, the deputy commander of the uh, U.S. ROC uh, Combined Forces Command. So, uh, Representative Kim, uh, you have the floor, please. Yeah. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, I am happy to meet all of you. Uh, I am National Assemblyman Kim Byung-ju, Democratic Party. I will be using interpreter uh, from now on. 예, 여러분 안녕하십니까 김병주 국회의원입니다 어, 오늘 70년 한미동맹을 올해 맞이해서 올 세미나 하는 것은 큰 의미가 있다고 봅니다 어, 사실 한미동맹은 여기 참가하신 모든 분들이 느끼듯이 과거에도 중요하고 현재도 중요하고 미래도 중요하다고 봅니다 그래서 우리 대한민국 국민들은 한미동맹에 대해서 지지를 어, 하고 있습니다 특히 우리 국회에서도 한미동맹을 국민의 대표로서 지지를 많이 합니다 어, 2년 전에는 제가 대표 발의를 해서 한미동맹 지지 결의안이 국회에 만장일치로 통과된 바가 있고요 작년에도 어, 한번 통과됐고 이번에 두달 전에는 
어, 국회의장 김진표 의장이 주장을 해서 주도해서 어, 한미동맹 70주년을 맞이해서 한미동맹 지지결의안이 통과가 됐습니다 이는 국회 국민을 대표하는 국회에서도 지속적으로 한미동맹을 지지하고 어, 또 한미동맹이 필요하다는 것을 의미합니다 앞으로 한미동맹이 지속적으로 발전하기 위해서는 저는 어, 한미동맹이 건강한 동맹이 되어야 된다 건강한 관계가 되어야 된다고 늘 생각해 왔습니다 저는 누구보다도 한미동맹의 중요성을 인식하고 한미동맹을 위해서 군에 있을 때도 그렇고 국회에 있을 때도 노력해 왔습니다 그런데 한미동맹이 지속적으로 발전하기 위해서는 건강한 관계가 돼야 된다는 겁니다 건강한 동맹이란 것은 우리가 주장 할수 있는 것은 주장을 하고 불만 요소는 불만을 해서 서로 어, 디스커션을 해서 합일점을 찾는 거죠 그러니까 서로 존중하고 믿음, 신뢰를 바탕으로 해서 상호 호혜적인 관계가 건강한 관계라고 봅니다 그런데 최근에 보면 은 한미동맹이 많이 강화는 되고 있지만 은 이러한 건강한 관계의 걸림돌이 많이 발생하고 있어서 아쉬운 점이 많습니다 예를 들면 작년에 인플레이션 감축법이라든가 원래 이, 어, 반도체법 이런 것들은 우리 기, 기업들에게 상당한 어, 어려움을 주고 있습니다 또한 인플레이션 감축법 같은 것이 발의될 때 한미동맹과는 전혀 상의 없이 이런 것이 이루어졌습니다 그래서 우리 언론이나 국민들은 한미동맹으로부터 뒤통수를 맞은 격이다라는 언론 보도도 있긴 했습니다 최근에 들어와서는 어, 실제 대통령실에 대한 도청 문제, 어, 유출된 어, 비밀에는 그런 문제가 언급이 되고 그런 것들이 사실로 드러나고 있습니다 이것은 동맹은 믿음을 기초로 하는데 이러한 문제가 발생함으로써 대단히 우리 대한민국 국민들은 유감스럽게 생각하고 있는 거죠 그래서 이런 것들은 솔직히 미국이 어, 사과하고 또한 확인하고 재발 방지에 대한 이런 것들을 한국과 <웃음> 이런 것들 천명해야 된다고 저는 생각합니다 또한 최근에는 미국이 지도적 어, 지나치게 미국 우선주의 정책을 펴는 경향이 있습니다 인플레이션 감축법도 그렇고 또 미국의 생각을 강요를 너무 지나치게 많이 하는 것이죠 예를 들면 우크라이나 전쟁에서 우리는 인도적 지원이나 경제적 지원 이런 것들 지속해 왔습니다 근데 최근에는 미국이 살상무기까지도 지원하도록 압박을 하는 걸로 어, 알고 있습니다 또한 대만 문제에 있어서도 미국의 주장을 한국이 그대로 받아들이도록 강요하는 면이 있죠 이런 것들은 사실은 건강한 관계라고 볼 수가 없죠 예전에 진보 보수 정부 할것 없이 대한민국의 정책은 한미동맹을 기본으로 해서 주변국과 잘 지내는 정책을 썼습니다 주변국과 적대적인 관계를 유지 안 하는 정책을 썼습니다 근데 지금은 점점 어, 중국이라든가 일부 편협된 이러한 정책으로 인해서 한반도의 어떤 지형이 상당히 안보의 지형이 깨지고 있어서 우려를 많이 하는 것들이 사실입니다 그래서 어, 미국 정부에서 <웃음> 이런 것들에 대해서도 좀 조심할 필요가 있죠 특히 한미일 어, 협력 관계를 20년 전부터 미국은 우리 정부에 강조했습니다 한미일 협력을 강화하라 그렇지만은 어, 미국의 역할은 잘 못했습니다 한미일 협력 강화 저도 동의합니다 그런데 한미일 협력이 강화되려면 은 한미동맹은 당연히 강하기 때문에 거기서 문제가 없는데 한일 관계가 좋아져야만이 한미일 관계가 좋아집니다 그런데 한일 관계는 좋아졌다가 나빠졌다 좋아졌다 나빠졌다를 반복합니다 왜일까요? 좀 좋아지고 나면 은 일본이 여기 일본도 계시지만 은 독도 영유권 주장하고 역사 문제에 대해서 문제 제기하고 부인하고 이렇게 되니까 우리 한국 국민들의 자존심을 손상시키고 우려를 하니까 다시 한일 관계가 나빠지는 거죠 거기서 미국의 역할은 중요합니다 미국은 한미일 관계를 한일 관계를 좋게 하라고만 요구했지 미국의 역할은 하지 않고 있습니다 즉 미국은 일본에게 중재자 역할을 해야 되는 것이죠 그렇게 됐을 때 한미일 관계도 좋아질 수가 있다고 라 저는 생각을 합니다 그러니까 미국도 한미동맹을 강화하기 위해서는 미국의 역할을 요구만 할 것이 아니라 해야 된다고 생각합니다 저는 현재 70주년을 맞이해서 앞으로 미래 70년도 한미가 
한미 동맹을 강화한 가운데서 가야 된다고 생각하는데 그러기 위해서는 건강한 관계가 되고 건강한 관계가 되기 위해서는 한국 한국 정부도 뜨뜻하게 할 얘기는 할고 또 미국도 마찬가지입니다. 그러한 것들을 신뢰를 바탕으로 상호 호혜적으로 하는 거고 특히 역할을 해야 될 부분은 역할을 해야만이 건강한 관계가 됩니다. 만약 그걸 안 하게 되면은 한국 국민의 가슴 속에 반미 감정이 싹트기 시작합니다. 반미 감정이 싹트게 되면 건강하지 않은 경우는 미래 한미 관계에 영향을 미칠 수가 있는 것이죠. 그래서 한미 동맹에 돌아보면서 저는 미래 한미 동맹의 강화를 위해서는 건강한 관계로 가야 되고 우리 정부와 미국 정부가 또 여기 참석하신 모든 분들이 함께 가야 된다고 생각합니다. We go together. 같이 갑시다. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Representative Kim. Oh, sorry. Um, I think uh, your points about that the alliance needs to be sound and healthy uh, very interesting. And you also uh, showed uh, uh, that there are you know, different views here on, on obstacles and challenges, even though uh, I think you are clear on that the alliance should remain and, and become stronger. You're mentioning, I already <coughs> mentioned in my introductory remark, the IRA and other, other challenges that are apparently linked to the Alliance collaboration. So, so very interesting uh, to, to hear your views about that and look forward to the discussion about that, maybe between our two Korean representatives later on. And now I will actually slightly change the order here and ask our Japanese representative to come in and then Paul Wolfowitz could comment on, on uh, various uh, uh, um, aspects uh, relating to the US that might have come up. So if I may, uh, Lieutenant General Yamaguchi, uh, you're a professor in the Graduate School of International Relations at the Uni International University of, of Japan. Uh, you've served in the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force, including as a commanding general of the Research and Development uh, Command. So please, the, the floor is yours for introductory comments. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to thank to Asan Institute uh, for inviting me to this very important occasion in a very timely manner. Uh, that means um, President Yoon is in the United States, and he, thanks to President Yoon, uh, Korea-Japan relation became drastically changed and in a better way. I, I, I am uh, really glad to be in Seoul at uh, this point of time uh, to discuss very important issues. And let, let me, um, uh, I'm an the army officer, uh, a retired army officer, but unlike uh, General Harrison, um, the, uh, I'm not an uh, infantry, I'm not a uh, paratrooper, I'm a helicopter pilot. Um, if you uh, watch a movie, Top Gun Maverick, um, Navy, Navy aviator is something like this. <laughs> but when I say I, I'm an army aviator, in army society, uh, community, everybody looks, looks at me like a taxi driver, or truck driver, bus driver. <laughs> so I'm a modest uh, uh, military, uh, retired uh, military officer, humble one. And uh, I am, uh, as a helicopter pilot, I, I am very much optimistic by training. Um, helicopter does not have you know, parachute. So <laughs> So the optimism um, helps uh, uh, for my job. But being optimistic in academic um, arena doesn't help me look intelligent. Uh, but still, I keep uh, being, uh, let me keep being optimistic. I, uh, maybe three things, uh, rock us alliance and um, the Japan's possible contribution uh, to uh, uh, this area. And thirdly, trilateral uh, cooperation. And first of all, I uh, really appreciate uh, what you have done for 70 years. Uh, it's a tremendous achievement and tremendous uh, uh, contribution to uh, the region, uh, particularly for Japan. Uh, Japan, in, in the historical perspective, uh, more than 1,000 years, we have always been worried about threat f uh, through Korean Peninsula. The, this last 70 years uh, is an exception for uh, Japan's uh, more than 1,000 year history. We have never worried about uh, threat 
uh, from uh, through uh, Korean Peninsula uh, because of uh, young Americans and young, young Koreans are here uh, to protect um, this area. Uh, that is uh, protection of uh, Japanese western flank. Uh, it always be the most vulnerable part uh, in the history before uh, before or Showa period or uh, before 19th century, and so. We really um, appreciate it, uh, it that, and also because of uh, currently, uh, the particularly looking at the uh, uh, situation in Korean, on the Korean Peninsula, 2016-17, uh, there, there used to be lots of US, US Korea exercises showing the uh, determination uh, to, to uh, stand up against any kind of threat from North. Um, when North Korea there was very much aggressive in terms of uh, nuclear tests and uh, missile tests. And Japan, uh, Jap Japanese were scared about that. Uh, but uh, looking at uh, the uh, formidable uh, posture of U.S. forces here and Korean, uh, Korean uh, military here, um, we are very much uh, uh, pleased and we uh, have like sort of um, frontal defense in uh, this, uh, 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 of this area. That, <coughs> that means uh, Japan needs to be very, very staunch about our own defense, or our own defense uh, uh, provide perhaps backyard security for rock us alliance uh, in case of any contingency on, on the peninsula. Um, I, I was very much happy about uh, watching, uh, uh, the, the, uh, watching a fi uh, film uh, showing that the, uh, the, the, during the Korean War, um, the Korean pilots in Japan were taking briefing from uh, U.S. pilots. Um, that, that kind of uh, um, you know, support from Japan, uh, not only providing the facility of land or staging area, uh, but uh, we, uh, our defense uh, may uh, become a sort of backyard security for uh, U.S. forces and Korean forces operating um, the, around the uh, peninsula. And that is one of the things I, I wanted to say. And Japan's contribution, uh, recently, uh, thanks to uh, Kishida administration, we have, uh, we have decided to, to double uh, the defense budget. This is really good news for me. Um, <clears throat> uh, but um, I have to confess that the 200% the two, um, the, uh, budget does not necessarily mean 100% uh, you know, increase um, because of, uh, you know, so, sort of, um, uh, different uh, rhetoric to domestic audience and the uh, international audience. Uh, we have been, our, our government has been very, very careful to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to avoid that um, the perception among Japanese uh, the government is going too far. Um, in the meantime, so uh, we have been saying that uh, less than 1% of GDP is what we, um, we spend. But the, during that period, um, uh, we are spending more. Actually, uh, to the uh, outside audience, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, U.S. and the U.S. allies, uh, we needed to say we are spending more and more, we are buying more uh, equipment. Uh, so in some cases, uh, if we include pension for um, the ex-military officers, it, it was 1.2% or 1.3%. So uh, uh, please don't uh, uh, overestimate that, that increase. Uh, but please don't underestimate. Um, you know, increase, uh, increase, if it, it is only 70% increase, it does not necessarily uh, mean, uh, you know, small. Um, you know, defense budget, budget now 100% have fixed costs, uh, like payment for, uh, for uh, soldiers and uh, other sort of maintenance costs. So um, the amount for uh, newly uh, developed, newly uh, uh, Produ uh, uh, procured weapons are uh, uh, fixed, maybe 40% or 45%. So if uh, the budget go goes 170%, uh, it, it, uh, it does mean uh, increase of equipment, facility, and ammunition, uh, may maybe 250% uh, uh, in comparison with the current, uh, current uh, expenditure. And the, uh, another uh, point is uh, Japan has uh, been working really hard to increase our the defense posture uh, in the southwestern island and uh, surrounding Okinawa uh, from the end of uh, um, the uh, south end of uh, Kyushu to, uh, to tai, uh, Yonaguni, which is uh, next to Taiwan. Um, it, uh, it, 
uh, it, the distance between uh, between those two um, the ways that uh, 13, 1300 kilometers, which is all, all, uh, almost the same as Japan's main islands, uh, the length. Um, in that area, we have uh, more than hundreds of uh, islands that we need to defend. Uh, de we need to uh, de uh, defend them, and uh, defending all uh, is almost impo impossible. Uh, but uh, the, we, while well, we used to have only uh, troops on main uh, island of Okinawa, we are now having a new uh, uh, new posts, uh, including Yonaguni, Wesamosa Island. Uh, next to Yonaguni, we have Ishigaki Island. Uh, we are going to have uh, we are having a, a infantry, anti-air, and uh, anti-ship uh, missile uh, units, and Miyako next to, to uh, south of um, the Okinawa Main Island. We, we are uh, having. Uh, the same uh, capability. And Okinawa Main Island, uh, north of Okinawa, Amami Oshima is another island um, newly, uh, newly established base um, is located uh, with uh, uh, security unit uh, uh, and, and anti air and, and anti ship capabilities. That may provide us with a kind of our own denial capability. It's not it's not too robust, but still we have anti-air and, and, and local anti-air and anti-ship anti capabilities. Uh, uh, if uh, U.S. and uh, Japan get along with uh, the, um, the for, or for that purpose, our denial capability um, in the what we call first island chain uh, to uh, against any the a hostile uh, entity uh, can be very very effective uh, for. Uh, the uh, allies. Uh, that is exactly the same as protection of uh, sea lines of communication for Japan and Korea. So uh, uh, Japan's, uh, Japan's own defense, uh, uh, defense eff effort uh, they can, be, um, they can be in help uh, for uh, trilateral, uh, trilateral uh, defense or even uh, the wider uh, the defense for U.S. and uh, its allies, uh, yeah, defense posture. The lastly, let me talk about the trilateral cooperation uh, between U.S. and Japan and, uh, Japan and Korea. I was really lucky uh, to, uh, to participate in the very good opportunity at the late 1990s, uh, where uh, the uh, Gaston Sigu and the, uh, Carl Ford uh, took initiative to make make the trilateral cooperation um, the work. And that time, uh, it started with the, the Track 1.5 uh, meeting, or Track 2 meeting, uh, including military officers, government officials, and the, the scholars from uh, Kaida, um, including uh, colleague, uh, colleagues of the, uh, my favorite, uh, my, uh, my kind of brother, uh, the Dr. Chegang here. Um, his colleague used to be uh, working with us uh, for trilaterals. Uh, so and now I, I really look forward to, uh, to uh, see that uh, kind of uh, occasion in the near future. And uh, I uh, really hope that Asan uh, may, uh, may play the very, very important uh, role for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, General. Very interesting comments. And as, as you said, and as we discussed before, the fact that Japan is doubling its, its defense budget is, is, is quite a remarkable uh, development. Uh, looking back uh, through the whole post-war uh, period, uh, the way you're talking about defending the first island chain to, together, uh, I think is also very uh, interesting. And, and the scope, we've heard that as regards the trilateral collaboration, it might be wishes for it. There might be some that think that it's challenging in different ways. So what you say about possibilities for track 1.5 or track 2 to take that to, to the next level is, uh, I think, very interesting to hear. So I will now turn to Paul Wolfowitz. I don't think you need uh, much more um, uh, introduction. You held a wonderful uh, uh, lunch speech. You, you, uh, uh, we, you've spoken in many other uh, occasions, but uh, right now, among all other things you've done, you're a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, I understand. You've spent more than three years in public uh, uh, service in different, uh, different administrations, uh, seven different U.S. presidents. Is that really true? That's quite, quite impressive. And, of course, as president of the World Bank, it's a huge honor to have you here. And I, I on purpose, wanted to, to ask you to come in uh, lastly uh, uh, to, to wrap up a little bit. And maybe also, 
uh, responding to the question, uh, how, do you, how do you react to these comments from, from allies and, 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 and partners and, and what dilemmas, and I mean, what do you think is the state of the alliances and, and what dilemmas do you actually see that the US is facing in this uh, new, new era with all the, all the challenges that we've outlined? So please. Well, I hope I'm not going to throw a monkey wrench in your <laughs> order of discussion here, but I'd like to do two things that are a little bit sure. different. And one is not to talk so much about formal alliances as to talk about coalition. Okay, very good. And less about military than non-military. So here are two hobby horses of mine, um, if you know that slang term. Number one, to me it's shocking that six million people around the world have died from a virus that came out of China. Whether it was created in a lab or not, I don't care spread because of Chinese censorship and Chinese lying. And now the WHO is still run by a Chinese selected director general. We need a different kind of pandemic organization. We had a different one for HIV AIDS called the Global Fund. We, had a diff we have a different one for vaccines called Gavi. We need a different one for pandemics. And in my view, the way to create it is Trump got halfway there. He did the right thing by pulling the US out. Biden then came back unconditionally without any demand for reform. Trump should have demanded reform as a condition of the U.S. coming back and coming back with its funding. And I believe with, this is where the Quad could play a huge role, I think, and maybe with Korean participation as well. It doesn't have to be limited to the Quad. But basically to say we're going to have a new organization for dealing with pandemics because there's going to be another one. And if the Chinese keep behaving the way there is, it could come out of China again. The way they are, it could come out of China again. And we can't live with a country that lies about what's happening and that allows a virus to spread all over the world. That costs not just millions of lives, but it, it's done uncountable damage to the world economy. And it could be worse. And the next one, by the way, could come from a terrorist organization, which has always frightened me. And it was one of the things, by the way, after 9-11 that we were most worried about was the bio threat, not the nuclear threat, when it came to weapons of mass destruction. And I think, obviously, I have in mind an organization that China would not be a member of, but I'm not actually interested in excluding China. I accept the argument that China is too important in this field to exclude it. But the condition of participating has to be open to investigations. At the moment, all you can do is send a WHO team to go and whitewash everything that went on in China. That's the most they'll allow. If they will allow the kind of investigation that should be a requirement, then they could be a member of an organization like that. I think this is, is going to hit us again, as I said, and it could come from malice or it could come from an accident. But it's, we've seen what damage it can do, and it could have been worse could have been much more readily fatal, for example. And then a second area where I think the same kind of principle might apply, and that is the area of cybersecurity, particularly. And I think of two things. One is um, cyber censorship, basically. And in that respect, I really would like to see an organization that brings together countries that are transparent, which again, it probably excludes China, although I wouldn't object to their reforming. But if you think about taking the, uh, if we had started this when TTP was still around, but I, I'm, to be honest, not completely sure of who's in the following organization. Obviously, unfortunately, the United States is not. But if you added into that group of countries, India and Indonesia, you have probably a population twice the size of China's. In other words, a cyber market that is even bigger than China's, and that's a huge advantage if you're in the cyber business. I'm told that the cyber trade provisions of the TTP were actually very good if they had been implied in a broader way. And again, if China wants to be transparent and stop censoring access to the internet, that would be wonderful, it would be a breakthrough. But if we can't use it as leverage, at least let's use it as a way of competing more effectively. Which then brings me to my last point, which is I am very concerned, and this is both a national security issue and a personal security issue, and it's a commercial issue as well, 
it seems to me that Huawei is winning the battle for the next generation of, of the internet. Maybe I'm being too pessimistic. I followed it closely until about a year ago. Mm. Found it very difficult to get the right information, but it's, um, and it's very important to mention it here in Korea because one of the few competitors for Huawei, the two are your country, Ericsson, and, uh, well, sorry, in Finland, the two new NATO members in Nokia and Samsung. And I think we did a very bad job in making that market competitive, partly because there wasn't a U.S. player that was lobbying. I would love to see Korea and Sweden getting together to lobby if, it's, if the battle isn't lost already, but it is huge. I mean, as someone said, uh, data is to the future, to, to artificial intelligence, what oil was to the automobile industry. It's the driver of everything. And China aspires to be the Saudi Arabia of data. And with a 1.2 billion population, they start out with a huge advantage. But they're not the, by themselves, they're not bigger than the coalition that could be put together. And I'd love to see a coalition put together that would deal with that challenge, so. Very good. I think you've lifted the debate to a whole new level here by uh, not talking about the alliances in the strict uh, military sense, not even the military coalitions in a, in a strict security sense, but, but adding the, the wider security challenges that we're having, whether it's viruses or terrorist organizations, cybersecurity, uh, well, mobile telecom and, and I mean you you just touched on AI at the end there which I think is the the additional huge uh, challenge there's talk about moratoria or international uh, oversight bodies etc et, et and in, in a way I think it's no coincidence that one of the key topics as I understand it in the in the current or very imminent summit between you and, and Biden is the tech issues the tech issues are so closely linked to security policy and, and, and alliances these days that all those uh, dimension of the geo economy, which has become weapons uh, in, a, in a whole new way, apart from the kinetic uh, weapons. So I think that those are some very, very interesting uh, uh, remarks. Uh, so maybe I could turn back to, to other uh, colleagues. Or oh, you wanted to add something there? Yeah, yeah I just throw in one point, because yeah. uh, Mung Jun this morning mentioned that um, survey by the Wharton School that measures best countries in the world mm. it mentioned that Korea comes out as number six in most powerful. And the thing that keeps it from being number two or number one, or maybe number three, but the thing that held it back was it did well on military, it did well on economic, it did well on technology, I believe, but it did poorly on political leadership and political influence. And I think this, is, this subject is a place where the success of Korea in this field could make Korea, not by itself, but in combination with other members of these coalitions, could be a leader in an area that is, in my view, neglected, as I already said. So I'm sorry, but I took advantage of the, <laughs> the floor to bring up some issues that bother me a lot. So. I think that was mentioned by uh, the representative of the European Union earlier, that. Uh, a wish that uh, that uh, Korea would take a more prominent place in international debates, and as a matter of fact, we have a member of the Korean National Assembly here on the on the panel. So, uh, Representative Kim, would you would you like to uh, comment on what was said just said by by Mr. Wolfowitz here about uh, Korea coming out fantastically in these uh, rankings, but but the next step would maybe be to take a an even stronger and more prominent role on the international uh, stage. Uh, are you, would you be uh, comfortable in commenting on that? 네. 그 말씀에 전체적으로 저는 동의합니다. 지금 우리가 소프트 파워라든가 이런 면에서 세계를 현재 선도하고 있습니다. 특히 이런 분야는 저는 한미 간에 더 긴밀한 협조가 필요하다고 봅니다. 저는 오래 전부터 우리 한미 동맹이 군사 동맹 위주로 돼 왔다가 이제 좀 확장해 가고 있지 않습니까? 가치 동맹, 문화 동맹인데 진정한 동맹이 되기 위해서는 사실 기술 동맹이 되어야 된다는 생각을 오랫동안 해 왔습니다. 그래서 이런 분야는 세계와도 공유하지만 특히 한미 간에 좀더 긴밀히 
기술 공유가 필요하다고 생각을 합니다. 아마 이번 한미 정상회담에서 그런 것들이 좀 논의가 되어서 좀더그 분야의 그 기술 공유하는 면에서 좀더 어 오픈 자세로 했으면 좋겠습니다. 특히 그 분야 중에서도 군사 기술 분야, 또 사이버 분야, 또 우주 분야 이런 분야는 한미 간에 사실 한 2, 3년 전부터 좀 활성화되기 시작했지만은 아직도 초보적인 수준입니다. 그래서 앞으로 그런 분야는 좀더 활성화할 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. 네, 이상입니다. Well, thank you. I think those are very interesting comments. And clearly a lot of scope for, for Korea to take further step in its fantastic uh, journey. Uh, so, so thank you, Mr. Wolfowitz, for those uh, comments. Maybe someone else in the panel would like to comment on that wider definition of alliances and coalitions. Uh, uh, but there is also another issue that I'd like to drill into a little bit more before we invite the uh, audience for any comments. So please prepare if you have comments in mind. And, and that is what has been said about the trilateral uh, security and defense cooperation between Japan, uh, ROK, and, and, and the U.S. I think we've, uh, we've also both heard uh, that there is interest in that being deepened and taken to the new level, uh, but, and also understood that there might be challenges in, in that. We've heard this from the Korean and the, and the, and the Japanese uh, uh, panelists here. So, I mean, a question to you. Is it possible to deepen uh, that trilateral collaboration, take it to the next level? Uh, as an outsider coming from Europe, it seems as if that would be maybe even a necessary thing in the face of the uh, quite daunting challenges that we're seeing from, from China and, and Russia, and not to mention North Korea uh, these days. Uh, so uh, is there anyone on the panel who would like to comment on that? Yes. Yeah, thank yes. you. Um, Yamaguchi. Yep. Um, um, the for promoting uh, trilateral, particularly defense or diplomatic relations, this is really good time uh, for uh, from the point of view of Jam Japanese domestic politics. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida is a great leader, uh, different from uh, Mr. Abe, the late uh, Prime Minister Abe. I, 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 I admire him very much. I, I uh, respect what he, he has done. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, but Kishida, uh, Prime Minister Kishida is in a different style. Um, he has been uh, seen as a soft hand, uh, a soft liner, uh, but what he, have, he has done is quite um, hard policies. Uh, perhaps people do not have to worry about uh, he, he go going too far. Uh, that, that, may, uh, may, uh, that may have made uh, people uh, feel uh, not, uh, not uh, too uncomfortable uh, mm. because uh, uh, for uh, his kind of, uh, kind of aggressive, uh, aggressive or positive, uh, positive uh, attitude. And another point is um, the Foreign Minister Hayashi. Uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi, um, anecdote, anecdote to me is uh, whenever I go to an uh, event hosted by Korean embassy, I never fail to see him. <laughs> um, he, he is a regular attendance of uh, a Korean event, and um, he has good connection with China too. <laughs> and in, uh, in the meantime, um, he, he was educated in the United States, and he spent quite a long time as, as a, a staff member at the uh, U.S. Congress and promoting U.S.-Japan um, alliance at a, a grassroots level. Uh, for scholarship uh, for the young, young uh, American bureaucrats and military officers spend time in, uh, in Japan. So he knows the uh, importance, uh, importance of um, U.S.-Japan alliance, the importance of uh, Japan-Korea uh, relations and uh, uh, um, china sino japanese relations. Too. So it is a really good time to, to promote um, the trilateral relations. Thank, so, thank you. So uh, a, a soft hand promoting hard politics. Maybe I could ask you, Vice President Chair, to just briefly comment that because I want to bring in the audience for any comments. Is it a good time to deepen trilateral collaboration further? Mr. Chair. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, uh, all in my thought, and, and we need to develop trilateral security cooperation 
step by step. And that means uh, we can have uh, like TTS at the political level and strategic level. And, and also at the tactical level, we can develop the, the young officers or NCOs program, tr trilateral training program. And when I was working for the, the, the Rock Army headquarters, we initiated the, this program and uh, the mediated the USFJ uh, at Camp Jama. Mm -hmm. they, they promoted this, this kind of uh, program. That's going to be a very efficient way to develop the good relationship uh, among the three nations. But after that, uh, from 2017 or 2018, they, they stopped all the, all the program for the uh, trilateral uh, cooperation uh, training. So I, I think, uh, as you mentioned, that this is a good timing for to uh, initiate a uh, new uh, next step uh, cooperation uh, staging. Thank you, Vice President yeah. Chair. And we only have a couple of minutes, but I'd like to invite anyone from the audience to make a comment briefly or put a question to this uh, interesting panel. So the floor is open if there's someone who is a volunteer. Well, I don't think... there is no... Yeah. Let me... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just only one thing. Um, the, the I and uh, General Chun was uh, were at, uh, on the same table last night, and we talked about uh, anti-submarine warfare capability, um, uh, anti-submarine -wa warfare, and the Japan's uh, Japan's uh, uh, anti-submarine warfare capability is really high. Uh, by the way, my my uh, younger brother used to be surface officer, and my son is a submariner now, so I'm proud of uh, the, uh, uh, their capabilities, and. Uh, one thing I, uh, we can share the responsibility uh, between Korea and Japan is um, expanding, uh, looking <coughs> at expanding capability of North Korea, uh, particularly uh, if they, uh, they are the uh, ballistic missile submarines, uh, submarines that became uh, operational. Um, the, up until now, uh, South Korean de uh, missile defense has to keep watching that just North. Uh, but if uh, submarines are operational, uh, South Korean missile defense capabilities uh, should watch 360 degrees. So why don't we uh, cooperate uh, with, you know, and we are, we are going to take care of 180 degree and you take care of 100 degree exactly means the half of Japan Sea. Thank you uh, for that addition. Yeah. Uh, mm. I think it was Dr. Uh, Wolfowitz first and then uh, Representative Kim. Briefly. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for you. Yeah. What do you think is the potential of Swedish, Finnish, Korean co cooperation on <laughs> a range of issues? Well, it's, that's, it's that's three, a subject for another uh, panel, but it's, it certainly is there. It's right? three countries with some uh, common characteristics. Yeah, no, I completely agree. There's a lot of things to build on there, not only in the defense sector, but in telecoms, etc. I, I, uh, and this is becoming a reality more and more now as Sweden and Finland is joining as U.S. ally. So that will uh, give, provide another impetus. Small to, countries so. with a big neighbor and long sea coast. Uh, exactly. We share similar and challenges. And high tech. Yeah. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Kim, you get the last word before I uh, wrap up. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 기본적으로 한미일 협력은 필요하다고 봅니다. 하지만은 한미일 협력은 어, 경제나 문화 협력은 뭐 계속 강화할 수는 있겠지만은 안보 협력에는 한계점이 있다고 봅니다. 적절점을 유지해야지 더 크게 그 강화하는 데는 제한 사항이 많이 있습니다. 그세 가지 때문에 그렇습니다. 첫 번째는 조금 전에 얘기했듯이 한미일 관계가 좋아지려면 한일 관계가 좋아진다는 전제가 있는데 거기에는 일본이 끊임없이 어, 독도 영유권 주장이나 또는 역사 문제에 대해서 사죄나 반성 없이 이렇게 오는 게첫 번째 가지고 그래서 좋아지다가도 그런 일이 있으면 우리 국민들 감정상 또 나빠지고 하는 거죠 두 번째는 한미일 구조가 강화가 되면 북중러 구조가 
구조가 강화되는 거죠 30년 전까지만 해도 그것은 가능했습니다 공산 진영과 자유 진영이 나누어져 있을 때는 우리가 중국이나 러시아나 이런 공산 진영과 경제적인 교류나 문화적인 교류나 인적 교류를 일치하지 않았죠 근데 지금은 이미 경제적인 교류, 문화적인 교류, 인적 교류가 아주 활발해서 하나의 안보라든가 이런 것 잣대로 금을 걷기가 대단히 어려워진 구조이기 때문에 어, 한미일 구조와 북중로 구조로 가게 되면 은 우리 대한민국의 안보뿐만 아니라 특히 경제라든가 이런 문화라든가 이런 데 많은 영향을 미치기 때문에 우리 국민들 이 그것을 받아들이기가 어려울 겁니다 세 번째 한반도의 특수성이 있습니다 주변국 일본이나 중국이나 이런 데는 이중적인 구조를 우리와 갖고 있습니다 사실 어, 안보적으로는 중국이 위협이 되죠 일본도 어떤 면에서 독도 영유권 주장하는 측면에서는 독도와 관련돼서는 미래의 위협이 될 수도 있습니다 그렇지만 은 중국이나 일본이나 경제 교류가 아주 활발하고 인적 교류가 활발하고 문화 교류가 활발하기 때문에 이렇게 한미일 구조와 북중로 구조로 하기에는 이미 너무나 세계가 얽히고 주변 국가 얽혀 있기 때문에 이렇게 가는 것은 좀 제한 사항이 많죠. 그래서 한미일 관계에서는 적절점이 유지가 될 필요가 있다. 너무 지나치게 하다 보면은 한국의 대한민국의 국익 차원에서 봤을 때는 여러 가지 어려움이 있다고 라 봅니다 그래서 지나치게 미국도 한미일 관계에서 계속 요구할 것이 아니라 그 적절점을 어디까지 유지할 것이냐 이것이 중요하다고 보여집니다 일본도 마찬가지 한미일 개선을 하기 위해서는 독도 문제나 역사 문제에 대해서는 전향적인 그런 자세가 필요한데 그거 없이는 결코 좋아지다가도 지금 윤석열 정부 들어와서 한미일을 강조하기 때문에 일시적으로 좋아지겠죠 그렇지만 또 국민적인 저항을 받아서 또 원위치로 갈 수가 있는 이런 구조이기 때문에 3개국이 같이 노력을 해야 되는 그런 문제가 있습니다 감사합니다 So uh, thank you very much uh, Representative Kim for those uh, last words uh, Uh, we will uh, wrap up uh, now. Uh, I take away a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, it's a good time uh, in Japanese politics for deep and trilateral cooperation, but I think we were also reminded of the challenges. It needs to be grounded and supported by uh, majority of populations, whatever you do, also security policies. Um, uh, alliances need to be sound and healthy. Uh, Uh, we need to think not about alliances, but about partners and coalitions much more broadly, as uh, Dr. Wolfowitz reminded us, and in other areas than in purely in defense. And they must be legitimate, uh, uh, as uh, Andrew Harrison uh, said. So, so thank you for all of those wise words. And I sense that we could, could have continued for a while here, but time is up and coffee is waiting for us outside. So please join me in a, an applause for the great panelists. Yeah. Thank you.